You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... World Anvil is a browser-based world-building platform designed for all world builders, writers and novelists, dungeon masters, game developers, and everyone else. World Anvil keeps your world setting safe and organized, helps you find your characters, locations, plots, timelines, and maps quickly and easily as you write. Then, if you choose, you can showcase your amazing world building to the world, beautifully and interactively, to keep your readers engaged. You can even use our professional tier to build your career selling access to behind-the-scenes content your readers will love and growing your community. Build your world setting in any genre with over 25 custom-built world-building templates, complete with prompts to inspire your creativity. Allow your readers to explore the public parts of your world in an innovative new way with interactive maps, timelines, and wiki-style articles. Give special access to co-authors, beta readers, customers, or patrons to see exclusive behind-the-scenes content. There's a free version to get started with, with all of the major features. Guild membership offers you a host of extra options, including comprehensive privacy settings, co-authors, presentation options, and so much more. Join our community of over 800,000 world builders, including professional authors, Take part in competitions and learn more about world building at this fantastic online community. Use the coupon code HANK to get 20% off all 6 and 12 month subscriptions. WorldAnvil.com. I'm a recent convert and I know you will be too. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have James Corpondo on the show with me today. He's got a brand new book. It's been out for a couple of months now. It's called The Big Lie, and uh, it's a uh, a book in the in the Jack Switek series. Um, this is like the 25th anniversary or so for uh, for Jack Switek, isn't it? So it, the 25th. Well, thank you for having me. By the way, absolutely. So, yeah, Jack has been around since. Jack is, Switek has been around since 1994, so we're even a little bit beyond the uh, 25th anniversary at this point. So um, I wrote a book called The Pardon, uh, which was my first novel, and never intended to write a series, but um, fans caught on to him. And so now there are, I believe this is now number, the big lie is number 17 um, in the Jack Switek series and like number 28 overall for me and me. Uh, on the bookshelf that's crazy that is so crazy um uh before we uh dig too uh far into the to the book um we begin each show with the same question and that question is what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller yeah okay well this is we're gonna go way back on this one right <laughs> so i can remember um i was about 11 years old uh, and we had a tree farm. Uh, and so I grew up uh, north of Chicago in a very rural area. Um, perfect place to grow up, really. It was sort of a, you know, there's, you know, had a, a, a black lab who, you know, never spent a day of his life on a leash. And we would just go bicycling and freewheeling it, you know, all summer long. Um, and so um, I sort of discovered from my friends and one of our, you know, various downtimes in the woods or in the tree fort or whatever that, um, you know, we didn't have devices back then, right? You know, so we, didn't, we couldn't just spend all our time exercising our thumbs, uh, you know, on Snapchat or something. So um, they seem to like to hear stories. Um, and uh, I discovered that a great way to get them to listen to my stories was to put them into the story. So I, this is 
going back, some of your listeners may remember the old Mel Brooks movie, Blazing Saddles, which was a comedy Western. Well, maybe I was onto something because I created this comedy Western um, in which each of my friends was in the story. And I started writing uh, and um, thought, this is a lot of fun and this is something I would like to do. And I've always liked to read. So it was sort of a natural um, uh, kind of fit for me to think maybe I could actually do this. Uh, James, I saw um, a great video that you did, uh, a, a TEDx talk several years ago, and um, it was um, titled There's No Place Like Square One, I think it was. Um, and you you talk about your journey um, to becoming a writer, and when a new writer comes on the scene, we, we see kind of all the, the flash in the pan and uh, all of the promotion that goes behind it. And it seems like that this new author just, you know, uh, w- without any effort, wrote this book and, and you know, poured a couple of months of his life into it. And then, you know, there's this debut novel and, and it's all, it, it all looks so effortless. Um, but you really peel back the layers in that video and, and talk about the realities of what it's like to be at square one at the beginning and and being back at that place over and over and over again, um, why is it so important to you to kind of lay bare um, your story and uh, and and talk a little bit of if, if you would about the struggle to kind of find your voice and find your place in the publishing industry? So you know, I, I have people who who do have this perception that it's overnight success to become a writer. And, you know, my overnight success was like about a six year journey. I was, a, I was an attorney, <laughs> an attorney practicing law full time, pretty happy actually at what I was doing. But, you know, as I talked about earlier, I kind of had this dream since I was an 11 year old kid to, to be a writer. Um, and, uh, but it was just a dream. It wasn't a goal. My goal in life was to be, a writer and everybody else can have their own set of goals, but a lot of people have this dream, but they don't know. And, uh, and they have talent, um, but they don't really have a path to it because they don't think that they have the connection or, or some other magic that, that, that uh, you know, magic dust that they think is out there to make their script. And it really is one of the things I talked about in the TEDx talk is that it just really is about, perseverance. Um, and, uh, the setback I had was, um, you know, I spent, I was working full time. Um, and most, most writers that I know that finally break out, um, you know, they do have another career, did have another life, um, before writing. So, and I was no different. Um, but I spent four years, nights and weekends, writing a manuscript and it just crashed and burned. Right. I mean, at the end of the day, I had an agent who was very excited about it, but you know, he came to me after trying to sell it all summer and literally said, I have knocked on every door in New York city. (laughs) And I am sorry to tell you that there's nobody who wants your book. Um, and that was pretty devastating. Um, but, and I suppose I was lucky in the regard that I had someone like that who believed in me. And he gave me, his name was Artie Pine. And Artie gave me a couple of weeks to sort of digest that disappointment and um, called me back. And I'll never forget what he said, which was, you got the most encouraging rejection letters I've ever seen. <laughs> so, which I thought was just, I thought it was purely just spin, but it wasn't, you know, and he kind of walked me through it and said, you know, look, you had this, this, uh, this thing, this manuscript, and it was kind of unwieldy. It was about 250,000 words when it, you know, you know, a published novel is about 90,000 to a hundred thousand words. It was unwieldy. And, uh, he believed in me. And I think that's really kind of what it takes is finding someone who believes in you, um, and he was able somehow to convince me that it's a great idea to start at square one with a 
you know, new idea, page one, chapter one. And, and I went from there and I wrote the pardon in the next seven months instead of four years and already sold it to Harper Collins, uh, in a weekend. And, uh, the pardon became the Jack Switek series. And here we are a quarter of a century later and it's still going strong. It's so amazing. Um, w- you know, when, when people start thinking about, um, uh, a writing career, a lot of times they're unhappy with their day job, um, and writing kind of becomes an obsession with them. And, uh, you know, they, they find ways to work around their day job and they sell a couple of books. They, they kind of establish themselves as a writer and then they ditch the day job to, to write full time. Um, you're still a practicing attorney, aren't you? I am, you know, and I actually uh, teach um, law at University of Miami Law School as well. So I have kind of three professions. Um, um, and I, th- I think to go back at where, you know, th- at the beginning of your question, I thought you were going in, an, in a little different direction. But I would give you that reaction because that's the idea of people who write because they hate what they're doing. That's the wrong reason to write. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, first of all, you, you You've got to love to write and to sit down and do this because it's a solitary uh, uh, profession, uh, you know. And so, you know, if, if you've got a problem sitting in a chair in your own world and in your own head with your own characters, then uh, it's going to be miserable for you. So, um, and two things really happened. I actually stopped practicing law for about six years uh, to write my first five or six books. And and I got traction, but I also got pretty lonely. Um, you know, as I mentioned, it's lonely. For, it, it is, it is a solitary kind of profession. Some, some authors thrive on that. They love that. Um, I missed the camaraderie of the office and going in and seeing people. And honestly, I get a lot of great ideas. Not so much plot ideas, but the characters that you meet out in the world. You know, in the business world. You, you can't shut yourself off from that. Um, and um, so I went back on a part-time basis and have continued on that basis for the past 15 years or so. Um, and, um, and I find that it's, it's, I think it enhances um, my career as a writer to be plugged into, you know, I write legal thrillers. So it's important, I think, to keep abreast of what's going on. But, Practice of law has changed so much since 1994 when I wrote my first novel that um, I'm not sure I'd be all that relevant uh, right now if I were um, disconnected from that um, from the, the practice of law. Well, we we all know writers whom we love uh, that wrote some really dynamic legal thrillers early in their career, and then they don't practice law anymore. And they get farther and farther away from that thing that we loved about them. Not that we don't love the the stories that they do now, um, but it just seems impossible for them to go back and write that sort of story again when they've been disconnected from that world for twenty years or or so. Um, I I think it's it it's actually amazing that you stay plugged in um, because you know I, I think Stephen King probably famously shared the. Um, the writing advice, uh, you know, that, that a writer needs to read a lot and he needs to write a lot to be successful. But I like to add a third to that. And I think you need interaction with real human beings and uh, and you need to talk to people a lot. And if you're going to write legal thrillers, um, you probably need to be plugged into that world and 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 keep those juices flowing. Um, how do you manage your your writing time with your uh, your other day job? And uh, do, do you segment certain times when you're writing a book or how do you kind of juggle the, the management of, of, of keeping up two rigorous uh, jobs? Yeah. So that's a great question because it's, 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 uh, I, it took me a while to sort of find that, uh, what, find out what works in that. And I'm, so I'm a trial lawyer and I want to be a large law firm. Um, and that's an advantage for me because what that means is that I'm, I have the luxury of jumping when I practice law, I can, you know, in a case is going to trial, 
I just do that, you know, and I might, and I might, you know, uh, you know be away from home, you know, in a trial in New York city for, um, two months or something and, 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 um, and, and immerse myself in that case. And on the flip side of that, I have the luxury of telling them, okay, look, uh, you know, I have a deadline <laughs> on the book and I need to do nothing but write, you know, for the next month or two to finish this thing up. That's unique, you know, and, and I've been really blessed to have that, um, you know, that framework. Uh, uh, it's, it's really, uh, it's a tremendous advantage. Um, it, part of the reason I stopped practicing law back in 90, six is when I left um, was because he didn't have such a thing as telecommuting back then. You know, we're all becoming familiar with telecommuting now with COVID-19, but, it, uh, but, um, but back, but back then it was about FaceTime in the office. And if you weren't in the office, um, you were falling behind everyone else. Um, are not part of the team. Um, that's changed a lot. So I, I think now it's actually easier to juggle that time, right? Uh, that and and making your writing time. Now my schedule is when I'm when I am doing both, I'm able to schedule my most productive writing time is in the morning. So you know, first thing is take my kids to school uh, and drop them off and then from you know maybe seven thirty or eight till about eleven thirty or noon that's like a great day of writing and then hopefully if I have some other things practicing law I can confine those to the afternoon but you know when it's crunch time you do have to be able to put the book down and go to trial or step away from the law practice and finish the book and um, so far so good your protagonist, uh, Jack Switek, that, that we mentioned earlier, um, you have found yourself uh, yourself with him in some really precarious positions and and some some really excellent plot points um, through throughout writing this series. Um, I know that you said in the video that you try to avoid the kind of grabbed from the headlines uh, topics because they can be so timely and. You know, there, there's a lot to kind of steer around that. Um, how do you normally land on what a topic is going to be for a new book? So, yeah, I mean, I, I do try to be relevant. I don't, I don't want to, I, I think you can get into trouble if you try to, you know, you know, as what, whatever was the old law or law and order kind of moniker was, you know, ripped from the headlines they had. And so, um, I hate that moniker. I, I don't do that. That's not what I do with my books at all. I'm not fictionalizing some, you know, real life event. Uh, but what I do is look for what I see are trends um, in, you know, whatever pop culture or government or uh, or industry or the legal profession, and look for what I think is what's an interesting point of. Conflict, and of course, I mean every thriller writer always plays the the what if game. You know, uh, you, know uh, you know, what if this happened? What if that happened? And trying to imagine, you know, what uh, what would make an interesting storyline. You know, and and that is part of the exercise. You know, and and I will generally then kind of get that. You know, uh, you know, for the big lie, it was what if a member of the electoral college said, screw you, I'm going to vote whatever way I want. Um, that was, that was really where that premise started from, you know, and then you sketch out and you think, well, people wouldn't be very happy would they? or maybe some other people would be happy, you know, that, so, you know, and, and you kind of noodle that around a little bit and, and generally, um, you know, I, I had a big change here with this. I, you know, I had the same editor for, 23 years and she left right before the big lie. So, so what I'm telling you now is a lot of how I worked with Carolyn. I still sorting out how I work with my new editor, Sarah. Um, 
but the typical process was to get that what if hook, call her up, you know, chat about it a little bit. And then I'd write out about three or four pages. And she'd say, yeah, that's interesting. I just, then I'd do a full outline. I do an outline. A lot of writers don't do outlines. I do, you know, and my outlines are pretty substantial. So, you know, I think for the big lie, it was about 33 pages or something. So, and then she blesses that. And then I don't really don't see her or talk to her again until I have about the first hundred pages. And, and then once I have those hundred pages, um, everything falls into place. Cause if you do, you know, <laughs> I guess a little tip, any aspiring writers out there, if, if you're feeling lost at hundred pages, um, you need to reevaluate, right? Because you, things should start falling into place. You should be, things should be happening thereafter that are, oh, wow, didn't see that coming. But boy, that makes great sense. You know, that's so where you should be at about 100 pages. That, that's a, a, a great um, kind of look inside your, your process. Uh, did you become, um, obviously, your, your previous editor, you, you had such a uh, relationship with her, uh, you know, from numerous books that you'd worked on together. I, I would imagine that you'd kind of fallen into um, a routine with her. Not that routines are bad. Don't don't take what I'm saying is is that. But switching that up to kind of a whole new back end process for you um, was that um, was that challenging? Did it? Um, instigate new creative juices. Um, what, what was that experience like for you? So I would say, first of all, it was frightening, right? Because yeah, you're getting to I know imagine. someone and, and, you know, and so the, the biggest fear I had, and I feel like what I lost was, you know, it was really, it was Carolyn's idea to, to create the series, you know? So she's like, you know, she, I was, I wrote Jack Switek in 1994 left it alone for five books. And she came back around 2000, 2001 and said, you know, we're getting a lot of letters from people <laughs> saying, you know, whatever happened to Jack? Cause you know, in the first novel, he was like 28 years old, young, ambitious, ideological, and you know, a lot of, a lot of questions about him. So she, you know, had this, she was this institution of knowledge about the series. Right. She had, a, she had from the very beginning, she had an idea of where it should go uh, over the years. She, you know, would point out to me, well, you know, uh, you had Jack do this in the pardon. And that's really not consistent with, with now you have him doing, you know, in Gone Again. You know, so, uh, that was invaluable. Right. If it's someone who can keep your who knows your characters better than you do. Um, so I lost that. Um, but Sarah did a tremendous job coming and it also helped that she was sort of a fan of mine in the, within the house at Harper Collins. So she had read my books over the years. She wasn't totally cold to the series. Um, but you know, that has worked out. Now we're, um, I just delivered the 2021 release uh, two days ago, as a matter of fact. So, so, and I can tell you, you know, that, that process went incredibly smoothly. Um, so, um, not good, I guess. That's amazing. So let's talk about the new book a little bit, uh, The Big Lie. Um, you know, I, I read this book um, looking at the current events and the, the state of the world that we find ourselves in. Um, it, it's an election year here in the United States. I, I know that that this book, um, you probably worked on it a couple of years ago when you first conceived the idea for it, because we know kind of how the time frame of, of the publishing world works. Um, so this was not necessarily on everyone's minds, but did you did you kind of look forward and realize, OK, this is going to be an election year. This is something that people talk about, that pundits like to kind of prognosticate on and we we have this kind of weird um you know system uh in our political lives and we just trust that it's always going to work and we've had some precarious positions in the past where we have found 
you know, that our democracy kind of, you know, was balanced on a razor's edge and, and things just work out and, and they, they just keep working. Um, there's going to be a day sometime when, when that system breaks down. Uh, is, is that what you were thinking about? You know, the, the, the things we take for granted on a day to day basis, that these things just work. Um, it, 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 was that kind of the initial thought process for this book? So that's, the, that's the initial specific thought process. Now the, the broader, you know, spectrum, spectrum of this is simply that I live in Florida and Florida seems to be in the middle of uh, it's always in the middle of political chaos. Always, right? you know, it, so, it, you know, start, and so many you know, times it comes down with, to Florida. You know, hanging. Yeah. So, so living in that environment, you know, I thought, um, well, maybe politics uh, was the way to go. Um, you know, and and Jack Switek, I have a character there, Jack Switek. You know, in the very first novel, Jack defended death row inmates, but his father was the law and order governor of the state of Florida who signed the death warrants for, um, uh, for Jack's clients. So there was a father son conflict, but, I, but, you know, um, I had not really done much with the fact that Jack's sort of unique, you know, his father was a former governor of Florida. Maybe there's a political angle here with the Florida connection and so forth. Um, and people may not realize this, um, but, in 2016, you know, we have the Electoral College, and most people have a loose sense of what that is because, you know, the popular vote in this country does not necessarily carry the day, right? You have to win a certain number of Electoral College votes. Everybody sort of gets that concept. Uh, but what a lot of people don't get is that, you know, the Electoral College, that's actual people, you know, and they actually go to a meeting in December and they're expected to vote in however, whichever way the vote in their pot in their state went. So Florida has 29 electoral college members. If the state of Florida goes 51% for one candidate, well, that candidate is supposed to get all 29 electoral college votes wins a hundred percent of the electoral college, even though you've won 51% of the vote. Right? So what happened in 2016 that some people are very unaware of is that, in two states, the members of the Electoral College said, I don't care which way my state voted. Um, I'm going to vote for the other candidate. Um, and they were clearly protest votes because it's not what you can, a lot of listeners might be thinking right now. Um, they actually refused to vote for Hillary Clinton. Um, two of them in the state of Washington voted, I think, for Colin Powell, who wasn't even on the ballot, uh, right? And and somebody from somebody from Colorado voted for John Kasich, uh, the former governor of uh, Ohio, um, who wasn't on the ballot. So those were clearly those were clearly protest votes, right? Um, and they didn't make a difference in the election. But this was so this was 2016, and so that's the kind of thing when I mentioned, you know. Not really ripped from the headlines, but it's sort of like, well, what would happen, you know, if it did make a difference? Um, if somebody decided, I don't care how my state voted, I'm a, you know, I'm a member of the Electoral College and I can vote however I want. And what kind of, you know, chaos might um, flow from that? And so that became, you know, being Florida, the epicenter of confusion in elections to begin with. I thought this would be an interesting um, uh, premise uh, for Jack's next legal and uh, thriller um, adventure of uh, getting in the middle of this debate where literally the White House is in the balance. Um, and it's not that far fetched. Um, you know, it is actually, you know, as I just said, there's three electors who change their votes. Um, back in 2016, so um, so that's the premise of it. I'm not. I, I I can tell you that I don't love politics. I'm not a political junkie. I don't think you have to be a political junkie to find this book interesting. Um, but uh, this is not going to be a trend for me. I mean, politics. Like I said, I've, there's 17 in the series. I think 
you qualify one of them as a political thriller, uh, uh, if you call this a political thriller. But um, it was fun. It was fun to see get Jack in a new environment. Well, James, what what I love about this book is that, you know, the Electoral College is sort of this nebulous entity to a lot of people. It's it's something that that definitely controls our lives uh, at some point. Um, but we don't really think about who the people are, the players in this. And, and what you really do in this book is you put a human face on that and uh, and we start looking um, that that this is something that absolutely could happen, and because th- these are humans that we're talking about, these are real people, these are citizens just like us, and and um, I, th- yeah, that that really put a a different spin on the whole story for me, and I know it will for a lot of readers. That's the, that's the idea. I mean, I do generally write stories, and it's sort of keeping in theme in that regard. Is that uh, I write stories about ordinary people, um, right. Getting into extraordinary circumstances. Um, so, you know, the, the, the main characters in the big lie are not the big powerful politicians. They, they are ordinary people. And, um, I like writing that story. Uh, and I, I think a lot of people, um, prefer, um, that spin out of story rather than, um, you know, another, um, another case about a president or about uh, whoever it might be at the the pinnacle of power. It's really about someone who's impacted by the pinnacle of power. The new book is called The Big Lie. Uh, It's out available everywhere now in in hardback, uh, Kindle edition, and audiobook. I love your audiobooks, um, by the way. Um, James, if if people uh, are you know, or just discovering you, God forbid, and, and want to dig into all the great stuff that you do, where can they connect with you online? So I'm on Facebook, um, you know, and I, and I, you know, I'm, I'm pretty active on it as well. Um, and I have a website, jamesrapondo.com. Great. We'll put a link to both of those in the show notes of this episode. The Big Lie, the brand new Jack Switek uh, novel is out everywhere now. Go grab it. There's links to it in the show notes. Uh, James, it's been so much fun chatting. Thank you for joining me today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Authors, I have a fantastic new service to tell you about. It's called PubSite. PubSite is a service to help you build your very own website your home on the web where you can promote your work and give your fans a place to connect with you. PubSite is a website platform that allows every author, regardless of budget, to have a great looking professional website developed by the book marketing professionals at FSB Associates. PubSite is the new easy to use DIY website builder developed specifically for books and authors. Whether you're an author of one book or 20 or a small publisher, PubSite allows you to build, design, and most importantly, Update your website pain-free. No need to be dependent on a designer or webmaster to make a small but costly change to your website. Save the money and do it yourself. PubSite is the best platform for authors because it's a book-centric platform. PubSite was built just for authors and small publishers. Every design, feature, and layout is book-centric. They have customized designs for you to use. It's easy to build. No coding or HTML is necessary to create a stunning professional looking website with all the features you want get a custom domain name yourname.com it's simple to update you can add all of your books add a blog and a book tour sell from any retailer manage your email list and social media and even do e-commerce build your website with a 14-day free trial then pay just $19.99 per month which includes hosting and we offer packages starting at $499 to set up the website for you. Pub-Site.com, the place to help authors find their home on the web.